I'm David Hirsch, this is Dan Van Haften, and we're the authors of The Tyranny of Public Discourse, and you're watching A House Divided. <laughs> House Divided. I'm Daniel Weinberg and as usual we're at the broadcast studio here at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago and we're happy that you're with us today. Uh, we hope you are at least and if you are if you want to submit a question please feel free to do so. It's either at the bottom of the page or on Facebook Live both and if you'd like to order a book we always recommend that. We'll get you one a first edition signed and you can do that uh, in the viewer below the screen. So please feel free to do that at any time and we'll get that for you. Well, we've had these two gentlemen here before, but this is almost a culmination in a way of what they've been doing. So David Hirsch and Dan Van Haften, welcome. David Hirsch is an attorney in Des Moines. Uh, he has a BS from Michigan State University and a JD with distinction from the University of Iowa College of Law. He clerked for an Iowa Supreme Court justice, and he wrote for the, and does probably still, for the American Bar Association Journal for over a decade. He writes and speaks on legal ethics and on persuasive writing and speaking. Dan Van Haften uh, lives in Batavia, Illinois. He has a BS with high honor and an MS degrees in mathematics from Michigan State University and a PhD in electrical engineering from Stevens Institute of Technology. He began his career with AT&T Bell Laboratories in 1970 and retired from Alcatel-Lucent, if I'm correct on that, in 2007. Correct. His work involves software development and system testing on telecommunications systems. The two of them are co-authors of Abraham Lincoln and the Structure of Reason, The Ultimate Guide to the Gettysburg Address, The Ultimate Guide to the Declaration of Independence, and others. Their latest collaboration is what they're here for today. And I'll put this right up here. It's called The Tyranny of Public Discourse. Oh, I'll just hold it. Abraham Lincoln's Six Element Antidote for Meaningful and Persuasive Writing, published by Savas Beatty. It's 184 pages, illustrated, and $32.95, and worth every dime of that. Uh, and, I'll, and you'll see why as we go along here today. So, why is public discourse tyrannical? Whoa. Either of you. <laughs> because there no, there's no standard, really. We've forgotten how to be civil, and one of the reasons we forgot how to be civil is the very subject matter of this book, which uses the six elements of a proposition to enforce civility and to be persuasive, we threw it out. We threw the baby out with the bathwater, and it literally was forgotten for a long, long time. It's interesting, of course, you have Abraham Lincoln in the title. <clears throat> Publishers know that if you have Lincoln, or even Gettysburg, in a title, it'll sell. So. Is that why Lincoln is in the title? Because he's not the only one in this particular book. Well, Lincoln, probably the reason is because, let's go back to our first book, Abraham Lincoln and the Structure of Reason. We went through a discovery process of finding out Lincoln's method for persuasion. And that discovery process that we went through is kind of etched in our minds. And so it's hard for us to forget Abraham Lincoln. I was going to ask you first off, and here I am, uh, let's deconstruct how you got here. So the six elements of Euclid's plain geometry propositions, what led you down this line in the first place? Well, uh, I'll give you a real fast and short uh, synopsis. We met in first grade in Plymouth Elementary. David always said that math and English were the most important things to study if you wanted to become a lawyer. Uh, in 2007, David... Tell them about my study halls. Oh. Well, in study halls in, element, in middle school, David used to think that there was a, a mathematical 
basis for communication, so he was working with an algebraic representation of communication, and it, it, it I'll okay. just say it didn't work. It was, I, it, I kept it, banging my head against it, the it, wall. It, yeah. it was not, it was not validated in any any sense. So um, in 2007, when David was, was uh, wanted to write a column on. Lincoln and technology, I suggested we go down to Springfield and he'd do some research. And since this was about Abraham Lincoln, the ABA Journal gave him two pages instead of one, <laughs> you know. And so he wrote this column and then he said, oh, we should write a, a book about Abraham Lincoln as a lawyer. So we made a one-page outline of our book, Abraham Lincoln, The Structure of Reason. And when I retired from Alcatel Lucent in 2007, the very next day I was over in Spring, or over in DeKalb at the Founders Memorial Library at NIU, doing research, happy as a clam. And one of the things I came across in the course of my research is the statement that's in hundreds of books that Lincoln studied Euclid so as to learn what it means to demonstrate. And so as soon as I said that to David, I kind of knew he'd be excited, and he says, so what else did the book say? And I said, well, you know, they analyze his speeches, they talk about him being logical and persuasive, but that's, you know, we need to dig, David says, we need to dig deeper. So I, he says, you, Dan, you go do what Abraham Lincoln did. You study the first six books of Euclid. You learn what it means to demonstrate. And being a math major, I was not intimidated by this assignment. And so after a couple weeks, I came back, I'd found Proclus's commentaries on Euclid, which were written about 480 of the Common Era, where he presents these six definitions and he describes how they apply to Proposition 1, which, of course, well, all of this is in our book. To that, yes. Yeah. And, and that, the rest is history. The rest is history. Um, when you were in, Dan, earlier, some months ago, uh, you mentioned to me that people from the structure of reason, from the Gettysburg, in the uh, uh, Declaration of Independence books that you've done uh, following Euclid's propositions, you said people were coming up to you and asking for a workbook. How do we do this? Not as if the others weren't workbooks. To me, they were useful anyway. But you said that people wanted a workbook. So um, here we are. Uh, and you certainly included others besides Link Lincoln in this. Uh, be specific, Jefferson and both Obamas. Uh, but how did it evolve over the 10 years since you first come into this field? Um, how did it become a workbook then? You can answer that, David. Oh, or, 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 I can answer it. But <laughs> OK. And as soon as our first book was out, people automatically started asking. And we thought, uh, you know, in chapter two, we explained it directly. And if you went through it, we were hoping that people could figure out how to do it. Now, one person who did figure it out uh, wrote a blurb on the back, John Parrott of this book, a high school US history teacher. And I found out less than a year ago, or about a year ago, that he had been teaching uh, uh, the six elements of a proposition just because he read Abraham Lincoln and the, pro, uh, the, the structure of reason uh, to high school students, he had figured it out just like I had hoped people would. But most people said it's a difficult book. Um, so, okay. What, what we, age is this for, this book? Or what ages are it? Well, his class is high school. And they were understanding it? Yeah. And he, what he said was he had to first convince them that this was a worthwhile thing to do or else high school students aren't going to spend a minute on it. Uh, and, uh, and he told them why and he told them, taught them how and then he would go through his history courses and he said you, you would, at the end of each segment, you'd write a uh, essay based on the six elements, of the, uh, written according to the six elements of a proposition. And what, what's most rewarding to us is that he said he's got diverse students, they're all at different levels, but every single student had improved their ability to write. And, and thus a workbook. And he said that instead of uh, when they write an essay saying, I think, now they say, I know. Mm -hmm. So it's called a workbook. That's what we're saying it is. 
But at the same time, that can be very off-putting to many people. Uh, workbook. They'll, they'll think of going back to school and having to study Sunday night on something that they're not sure about. Um, can these exercises be inculcated and used by most people, high school on? We, we think so. We tried to write it in a way where we build incrementally and we lead people along. And we explain the principles in a, uh, in a way that we think is, is understandable. It, in, in some senses, if, if you think about an English grammar book, that's kind of dry, okay? But we're, we're effectively writing a, a, a grammar for the use of these six elements. And, how to, and so we tried to use examples from Thomas Jefferson and from Abraham Lincoln to illustrate these principles in, a, in an understandable way and to have some fun with these writings as we did it. And, and you've, you've read some of the letters that we selected, and they're, they're both in, interesting from a historical standpoint, but they're also, uh, especially some of Jefferson's, are just downright fun. Yeah, well, we'll get to some of those as well. Um, I think maybe uh, our viewing audience should see uh, what the six principles are, so we, can, okay. so we can talk here a bit about it and not give a lecture, but at the same time demonstrate what those are. So what are Euclid's propositions and the six elements that we are going to be showing in a moment? Well, the, the, the first element is an enunciation which has a given and a sought. And the given is a very basic factual uh, statement of where you're starting. And the sought is a general statement of what you want to accomplish. The second element is the exposition. And this is also factual basis, but it establishes the the grounds for the investigation that follows, and it lays the groundwork for the specification and the construction and, and further on in the proposition. The third element is the specification, which is a more precise statement of what's sought. Now the fourth element is the construction, and this arrays the evidence that you will present as you um, as you move into the proof. So for example, in the Declaration of Independence, the classic phraseology Thomas Jefferson uses, let, let facts be submitted to a candid world. That's a classic setup for a construction. And of course, his facts are 20 plus complaints against King George. But you, 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 you at that point, array the, the facts or the evidence that's appropriate for your proposition. And then the fifth element is the proof, and you don't argue until you get to the fifth element, the proof. And then the Many people argue too early, don't they? Yeah, it, well, in our world, some t people don't argue at all. They just present the sixth element, the conclusion. Mm -hmm. And of course, in a Euclidean proposition, there's a logical progression from the, the general sought to the more precise specification to the conclusion. Now, I'm going to read something. Uh, there's a New York journalist that was out in Kansas in 1859. Albert D. Richardson. And he went and saw Lincoln give a talk in Troy, uh, in Troy, Kansas. And he wrote, not more than 40 people assembled in that little bare-walled courthouse. There was none of the magnetism of multitude to inspire the long, angular, ungainly orator who rose up behind a rough table. With little gesticulation, and that little ungraceful, he began not to declaim but to talk in a conversational tone. He argued the question of slavery in the territories in the language of an average Ohio or New York farmer. I thought, Richardson did, if the Illinoisans consider this a great man, their ideas must be very peculiar. But in 10 or 15 minutes, I was unconsciously and irresistibly drawn by the clearness and closeness of his argument. Link after link, it was forged and welded like a blacksmith's chain. He made few assertions, but merely asked questions. Is not this true? If you admit that fact, is not this induction correct? Give him his premises, and his conclusions were as inevitable as death. So you don't have to be Lincoln to do this. It made help but it's not going to hurt to be yourself. And you can learn from this workbook how to have conclusions that are as inevitable, inevitable as death. So that was Lincoln. So 
let us, so we saw those, um, uh, and it, this is for complex, not just simple, like the Gettysburg Address was a little bit simple in a way, although eloquent, thank you, but uh, it works for very complex uh, questions as well, does it not? You can yes. build upon itself. Should work for any situation where you have something you want to persuade or prove, if you have facts and want to prove with scientific logic, uh, the system should work. And this really is a verbal form of the scientific method. Yeah, exactly. It is a scientific method. Uh, we have in here, you show some visual visualizations of the propositions, and we have a slide for that. So you display it by uh, that you develop from the structure of reason to the Gettysburg Address book, and that was that development. Is there further development in this book, or are you just now using what you've done before in a logical way in many different examples? The biggest, well, first of all, there's a progression in all our books because we were learning from ground zero to begin with when we began this endeavor 11 years ago. And I would say the biggest uh, addition to the uh, explanation of the theory is uh, the, that, we, that we developed most in this book is the enunciation, I mean the exposition, the second element, uh, where we focused on the investigation and really honed in on what an investigation is and really figured out, hey, this is the scientific method. And uh, we explain it step by step, and, and that, that's the thing I'm personally most proud of. Is yeah, I, I, I would agree. I mean, the, the, the chapter on the investigation was one of the last chapters we added, but it took us um, a lot of work in demarcating. For example, we went through the 19,000 letters of Thomas Jefferson and found over 700 instances where Jefferson's arguments demarcated, and, and working through that, forces you to think about these elements. I mean, obviously you think about Jefferson's words and the arguments he's making, but you become more comfortable with the elements. And that was a, a five-year project, essentially. It's not going to take five years for someone to go through this book, of course. No, no. not so at all. So it can be useful very quickly, and literally useful in one's own life. That's what I found from this especially. Right. Going through this, it improves one. Just by reading and studying and understanding, and enjoying the process. I, I found the process excellent. Yeah, but the other thing that we think is really important is this should make you a, a more educated listener because when you're listening to someone else talk, I'm not saying they have to use the six elements, but this is, this is a process for grounding your, your inferences in fact. And so if if fact is a little bit weak or non-existent in someone's argument, uh, that's, that should be a red flag. It, it definitely has changed the way I look at what's going on around me. It, it mm -hmm. forces you to think in a more logical way. And that's, we all need that today if we're going to get through our democracy, actually, I may as well just say it, uh, and learn wh whom we need to be and how others are presenting themselves. We need to understand them as much as ourselves be able to present what we would like to. Uh, you mentioned Proclus. Uh, who was he and how does he fit into the picture? Well, Proclus was a Neoplatonist philosopher and he, he wrote a lot of commentaries on a lot of stuff, uh, including Christianity and Greek religion and a whole bunch of other things. But for, he also wrote a commentary on Euclid's elements and Proclus had available to him various writings that we, I don't think we have anymore on Euclid, and, and his commentaries explain how the, he, he provides this, the definitions of the six elements, and then he shows how the uh, first proposition in Euclid, which is to construct an equilateral triangle on a straight line, where the given is a straight line and the side is to construct an equilateral triangle. He shows how the six elements map into proposition one. And, and one of the keys is, is that uh, geometric propositions are about words and ideas. And Lincoln and Jefferson dealt with words and ideas. The, the, the ideas uh, Euclid dealt with were 
things like point, line, and plane. Lincoln dealt with things like slavery and union, more complex. Yeah. So and how does that straight line become that triangle that you... Well, he, he shows it with words and diagrams because algebra didn't exist back then. Mm -hmm. And each of those uh, definitions that he preserved is one sentence. So, for example, the, the, the enunciation is the um, given and the sought. So the given is a straight line. This, this is not a complex lesson in geometry. This is a lesson in logic. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to answer your question, how did that straight line become an equilateral triangle? So he starts out with a given of a straight line, and the side is to construct an equilateral triangle. Then in the exposition, he has a really simple ex exposition, and we actually discuss, in, as David says, in depth the investigation. His proposition one definition, exposition is let A and B be the endpoints of the straight line. And then he restates the general side as a more precise specification. Thus, we are to construct an equilateral triangle on the line AB. Mm -hmm. So he's got this line AB. And then he says, he goes to the construction. So the construction is not argumentative. He just does stuff. He says, let's draw a circle around the point B with uh, radius AB, and let's draw a circle around the point A with radius BA. And they intersect up here at a point he calls C. And then he says, let's draw AC and let's draw BC. And, you, have to and kind of, you should be seeing these actually. Yeah, so, so, so actually the, the, the picture of the construction is on the cover of, of Abraham Lincoln, The Structure of Reason. Yeah. So at this point he hasn't done any arguing whatsoever. And now he gets to the fifth element, the proof, and he makes an argument, and I won't go through it, but it is in uh, the tyranny of public discourse that as a result of the construction, he can argue that these three lines, AB, AC, and BC are equal. And then he gets to his thought, thus we have constructed an equilateral triangle of the line AB, uh, a, a, B, QED, quod erat demonstrandum. You know, and you put colors to them as a, yeah. as a visual help. And I was trying to see those colors. I saw that brown was at the bottom. It seemed to me like soil in a way, you know? It's, it's grounding. And then the green comes up out of that soil. That's your the next part of the triangle in, in, in the green. And then, then comes red, like the blossoms that come out of the green is how I saw it. And uh, maybe that's too nature-esque, but there it is. That's what I was thinking when I saw this. Do the colors really mean anything? Well, the brown is, yeah, they do. And, and they track the theory. They're literally, they tell you what part of the theory those words are that are that color. Mm -hmm. And the brown is foundation, just like you felt. Mm -hmm. And uh, the green is logical direction. And so uh, you know, sought specification conclusion. And uh, the red, uh, we kind of uh, put it as a metaphor for fire. Uh, fire can be good or bad. And, but fire is the most dangerous part of any kind of speech, writing, or uh, any form of persuasion. And if you use it right, it, it, people feel just like you described before of that, uh, what was it, 18 whatever year speech that you read. 1859. Yeah. And uh, uh, that it's just iron. It's, uh, and, and because all the facts are either indisputable or nearly indisputable, or you go step by step, all of a sudden you get to the end. And of course, that has to be the conclusion. So as you say, red is, is dangerous because it's the argument is its essence. So that's where you, you have to be very careful in speaking to someone, yes? It, yes. yes, and every time you argue, you're using up credibility. Uh, in other words, you're attacking something, or you're trying to uh, persuade someone of something that probably they either don't understand or don't believe. And so because the elements force you to do it step by step, you're not using any more credibility than you should, and you're coming out just right, and you're not misleading anyone, and the credibility uh, just grows naturally, and if you've got credibility, you're going to win even sometimes when you shouldn't. <laughs> Not a bad thing. Uh, now, in one of the chapters, the Freedom Chapter, uh, you present uh, earlier students of Lincoln wrote about Lincoln's structure, uh, Judge Wanamaker being one of them in 1918. He, he, he wrote later on, he thought Lincoln may have 
uh, inculcated the structure of the Declaration of Independence into his own thoughts, because that was so important to him, uh, almost the basis of his, of his political thought. So others earlier uh, have tried to ferret out the reasoning behind Lincoln's writings, and maybe others, but they never collect, connected it to Euclid, it seems. How did Euclid get lost in these intervening years? Uh, well, all I can theorize is that people are scared of math because Euclid, the statement that you, Lincoln studied Euclid so as to learn what it means to demonstrate is fairly prevalent in Lincoln books, biographies, et cetera. So that statement never got lost. The issue is, is how do you go from there to the six elements? And, and, and effectively, the six elements are somewhat lost in, math, in the world of mathematics. Many, uh, I'm a math major, I never heard of the six elements of a proposition and going through a bachelor's and master's degree in math. I've talked to a few math majors that know about the six elements, but most of them don't. So, uh, you know, if you go back and read math history books from the 1880s, people can't even agree on the, the, whether you use the word elements or other phrases to describe these things. So essentially, you have to dig into math history and go back to Proclus recording the definitions. And I'm not certain that that many historians are, well, for 150 years they didn't do that. Hmm. So um, <laughs> we're, we're all happy that you found it out, uh, tripping well, into it, actually. Well, and, and, and David challenged me to do it, and, and the only time I was freaking out is when I didn't know the answer, but it took me about three weeks, and you know, we got there. You got there. Um, I was on the Lincoln College Board at Lincoln, Illinois for a little over a decade and helped build the museum there, get it, get it done. Right. Beautiful little museum. It, it I is, I expect yeah. everyone should go to it. If you're I, going I, down to Springfield, stop in Lincoln, Illinois and see uh, Lincoln College's Museum of Lincoln. And the, we had a, a phrase that one of our board members came up with, learn from Lincoln, live like Lincoln. And that's what this book is. If you learn from Lincoln, you can live like Lincoln and others as well. Are you seeing schools now interested in this workbook? Uh, are you out to transform the educational system? And is there a, a book for grade schools, maybe with different language, but to help grade school kids begin to learn as well? So are you finding schools coming to you? Well, or will they now? Hopefully, they will. Uh, you know, this is new to everybody. Even though the you know, we've had this out now for 11 years, um, this is the first book that really teaches it specifically. And while uh, it's clear that a high school student can uh, learn it, uh, I believe a middle school student should be able to learn it. And I think the basic feel and principles could be inculcated right down in elementary school, and I mean first grade. Mm -hmm. so, so for about five years, I, I spoke uh, about Abraham Lincoln, the structure of reason at English classes at Wabanzi Community College, and one of the, 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 the uh, uh, instructor who requested me to talk there is one of the people who requested this workbook, and he's mentioned in the front end, and, and so uh, I think there is a place in the classroom for this the subject. And, I think and, so. And I, saw, and I saw it work, and it was just fun to talk to the students, especially during the Q and A part of the meeting, to uh, or class, to uh, get their feedback, and, and you know. So I would suggest not only do you, of your viewing public think about getting this for your own children and grandchildren, maybe even yourself, uh, but to make sure your library, local libraries, have a copy or three in there so that they can show the people in the local community something that could help them in presentations. That's what they're all doing in starting up in middle school and on. You have to present things. And this is a way that you're going to be able to do that. I recommend this highly and not think of a workbook as pejorative, but as really something quite helpful. Let's speak of Thomas Jefferson. Uh, you use 13 examples. Uh, of his use of the proposition compared to eight of Lincoln in here. Right. Um, 
Each of them started about the same time, I think. Lincoln at age 45. The earliest one you have for Jefferson is at age 43. No, no, the Declaration of Independence is the earliest one. That's the earliest one? Yes. Okay, I, I, was, I, should, I missed that, yeah. sorry. Uh, so did Jefferson then use these propositions much earlier? But of course he was educated, so he may have had, uh, had Euclid at home. Probably the most highly educated man in the American. At that time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, so he started yeah, to use yeah. it well, immediately. Well, well, one of the, I mean, Shadwell burned and so we don't have, uh, you know, we, we know about Jefferson's library, but we don't know the books that were in Shadwell that were part of his college education. So we can theorize that he learned about this possibly at William and Mary because he had two very wonderful professors. And, uh, um, uh, but we see it in the Declaration, and, in the, and then as I mentioned earlier, we, 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 we found over 700 instances, and, and it spans from 1776 to 1826 when he, when he died. You were saying how uh, you really enjoyed a number of Jefferson's speeches and writings. Give us an example of one or two that you found fascinating that you had to put into this book. Well, it's not in the book, but the, my, one of my favorite letters oh, is... Sorry, you can't read this one, but uh, we'll hear about it now. We're out of salad oil. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, he, he uh, Jefferson makes an argument for the steps to purchase salad oil because they're out at Monticello, and of course, buying, uh, buying. I mean, we we, we have uh, numerous letters about purchasing wine, but but one of, one of the letters that um, w what we did with Jefferson. Um, well, let's give him a letter, like the one where yeah, he yeah. asks his daughter to come to visit him. Yeah, I was going to talk about the... Go oh, ahead. Okay. Oh, yeah, you have a number of very good ones. The, there, there, and, there's and, you a know, number. the demarcations at the back that yeah. you have, <clears throat> uh, perpetual motion machine, that, that's what I was silence gonna talk. on slavery, yeah. uh, a, a statue for religious freedom, yeah. uh, all sorts of things. Well, but well, well the perpetual one. motion letter is, is an interesting one because we actually make a point that in this... He gets a letter from someone in Philadelphia about a perpetual motion machine, and the, this fellow was charging five bu bucks for men to go see it, and women could get in free. And, and so Jefferson writes a letter back, sort of attacking the perpetual motion machine, but he doesn't have all the facts. And, and so he's only using his credibility to attack it. And, but th so this is an example where when you don't have the facts, you, you know, you, you have to. It, 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 it's a handicap. Well, the one fact he didn't have is there was a guy in the back turning a crank behind the, you know, like the <laughs> Wizard of Oz. Um, but you can see just from Jefferson's letters and the le other letters that are in there that this technique works for anything. If you have a point you want to make, uh, it works. Um, how about the Obamas? They're in. How did you find the Obamas? Both Michelle and Barack are in here because we started looking at their speeches after Dan found a way to get a book to the president at when uh -huh. early, go ahead. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, in, in, uh, after Abraham Lincoln, The Structure of Reason came out, um, I was in a Borders near the White House in, in December of 2010, and a gentleman came up to me and said, you ought to get a copy of your book to President Obama. I said, that sounds good. But I don't know how. He says, I do. He was the Borders account executive who worked with the White House librarian. So I, I wrote a handwritten note. My guess is presidents get handwritten notes from children, but that's the best I could do. And I signed a book. And then we started monitoring the speeches. And in January of 2011, President Obama gave a speech at the memorial service for the Gabriel Gifford uh, incident where six people were killed in, in uh, Tucson. And... Um, and it demarcated. And you so heard yourself. We, yeah, so we, we looked at all the speeches from the first half of 2011, the first six months, and, and including the uh, Osama bin Laden speech, which is a classic example of how to orchestrate, uh, lay out facts in the given, and then in the exposition, and then in the construction. And that demarcated, and then um, the, um, so and Michelle also well 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 and, and then then um, 
Well, she gave a great speech, and we just there so, it was. Well, well yeah. and, and, and actually, to, just to be totally honest, David suggested we included Michelle's speech, and initially I was against it because I said we don't want to be political. But then I read two lines in the, her speech. One is she's talking about how a 140-character tweet is no way to deal with complex issues, mm -hmm. and the other is the theme throughout where she talks about the importance of civility. And she's overlapping exactly some of the main points that we make, which is you, you need a more complex structure than a sound bite to intelligently talk about many issues. So when you take apart one of these letters, for instance, if you quote a paragraph, uh, you're, it's like cutting, you, it's like cutting an arm off or a leg off. Each part of our body has a function. And if you want to understand that letter, show the whole letter, just like you want to see the whole person. Yeah, for example, Jefferson is one of the most quoted people. In other words, people will find a sound bite that supports their position, and then they'll say, I'm right. So a few years ago, there was a letter to the editor of the Wall Street Journal they had a quotation from Je Jefferson about something to the effect that all taxes are bad. And I said, this language doesn't sound like Jefferson. After you've read 19,000 letters, you kind of get a feel for how someone writes. And so I, I poked around and I found out that the papers of Thomas Jefferson, the folks in Charlottesville, had a website about this fake quotation that was created in the 50s. And, and so I wrote an email to the editor, the, the person in charge of the letters to the editor of the Wall Street Journal, and he wrote back and he says, well, at least there was a website on it, but that, that was it. But, <laughs> but, so we want people to read entire letters demarcated and, and broken up so you can see the logical structure, and you'll understand them much better, and uh, you won't take things out of context. You write a short lesson on, <clears throat> on collaboration. And how do the six elements make collaboration tasks easier? We're all going to be with other people and have to collaborate. And what are the drawbacks? You mentioned drawbacks of collaboration, composition of a proposition. How does, col how does collaboration work with the six elements, and what are those drawbacks, too? You know, the beauty of the six elements is you've got six vessels, and so you're you're thinking about something. Everybody has something they're doing, something on their mind. You can't put together something all at once, so you get an idea, you write it down, just like Lincoln did in little slips of paper fragments, and he stuck it in his hat or wherever he put it. And then at some point, he would take those slips out and sort them. I'd like to think in six piles. I think that's the way he thought. And then he would... Uh, put them in order, each pile, and that's how he wrote his speeches. Uh, it, but, so because the, because, the, the, they're seg because the elements are individually defined, you can have one person working on one aspect, like uh, finding facts of, uh, on a certain point, uh, or, uh, uh, or uh, drafting, uh, trying to put those facts together in a way that makes sense, and other people doing other tasks, and uh, you use small pieces of time and work on one part, and it doesn't destroy any other part. Um, you know, the, the negatives of that uh, probably are if you have someone that doesn't work well in a group, or if you have trouble uh, uh, having someone at the top, uh, to control and coordinate properly, uh, that can get in your way. Mm. But the elements really do let you be more efficient in, in working. And work together with others as yes. well. Yes, yes. Um, now, I, we have a listing here of the demarcations in your book, and fascinating. I told you a couple of them. Here is Jefferson, How to Make a Newspaper Honest, uh, Inviting a Daughter to Washington, Plain English Writing. And with Lincoln, you have, uh, of course, Gettysburg Address. Uh, you also have uh, one of my favorite, one of the most important letters, I think, Lincoln ever wrote, and that's the George Robertson letter. And that one is fascinating. You should just do this book just for Robertson's letter 
and because what Lincoln is saying, although he seems he only said this, I can find once, that we're going to have a war over slavery. It's not going to happen yeah. otherwise. It, it's gone too far. So that's another one that's in there, and I love some of the ones that we have. Great Western uh, Station, uh, the military appointment to Grant for Robert Lincoln is in here. Right. And so fascinating letters. At the end of uh, the book, you have chapters on demarcation exercises. And how do these work at the end? When you come to the end of the book, you have these exercises. After you've read the book, how are they structured? We have a speech, and we say demarcate it after, you know, again, it's at the end of the book, so presumably by the time you get there, you know something about it. And uh, if you can do it, fine. If you can't do it, then we have another section where it gives hints. And uh, again, if you can do it, fine. If you, if you find it too difficult, then we have a suggested demarcation because there is you, usually uh, it's, it's pretty clear how this should demarcate. I mean, if it's demarcatable, and if it's done according to the six elements, you know, the edges aren't that hard once you get the hang of it. But there is room for uh, grayness in certain parts. And while your, your general principles need to be followed if the elements are going to work, sometimes the situation calls for graying it a little. And, uh, but that, that's basically how the exercises work. And it's like having a tutor right there. You're, you're giving, if you don't do it, here's a little hint to continue on. And if that doesn't, here's another suggestion. So it's having someone looking over their shoulder at the same time. And I'd like to think the book is enjoyable just to read straight through, and then you can make your own decision whether you want to do the exercises. Mm -hmm. We have questions after most of the... I was going to talk about the questions. After every chapter of most of them, you have <coughs> questions that are also exercises. Uh, in chapter 9, you ask, for instance, <clears throat> without the six elements of a proposition, would Lincoln have become president? That's a question you have there. So I'm, I'd like to know what your answer is. It seems that many presidents have become uh, president without a clue. If you believe the Cooper Union speech is what got uh, Lincoln to the presidency, the answer is without the six elements, no. And when you look at how, after 1854, his speech uh, is how much better his speeches were than the speeches before. Um, it's it, no comparison. Right. So you think he needed it to become president? Absolutely. Because of Cooper Union. And, and what's amazing, why is Lincoln, you know, I have to confess, uh, it, it's helpful to have his name in the title, as you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But he earned it. That guy had one year of formal education. He figured this out by himself, just by reading. You know, you talk about, we, we had a book, and a lot of people couldn't figure it out just because, it, I, and I blame it on us. I mean, if someone doesn't understand what we write, it's our fault. Um, but the fact that he figured it out uh, from uh, just by reading Euclid alone, when um, he earned it. Yeah, maybe it'll become a classic comic. So, uh, that's, that's another way, at least we, I, I learned in, in high school from classic comics, strangely enough. Yeah. Talk a, to us about synergy. You call it simple elegance and textured complexity. So why should construction not be used as an argument? What do you mean when you say facts are more important than logic? Talk about the synergy of all of this. If you, if you don't have facts, you don't have anything. Uh, so you've got to have facts. If Without facts, you're not going to have credibility. Facts are not relative, are they? Um, well, you'd have to give me the fact and the... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the synergy is the proposition itself takes all six elements and puts them together and they all... You change one of them and, and you might need to change all of them as far as what your content is. I was thinking about this and music is math uh, mathematical. Right. Right. Could a composer use Euclid in music? Could it be oral oh, in some oh, fashion? A, a, ask the mathematician. Yeah, well, that's, well that's David, what I David, David, David played violin in, no, in no. middle school. Not, not real well, by the well, way. Well, we have a violin, right? <laughs> well, no, wait. Okay. Um, uh, well, I, 
I'm just curious. It's just I, I, something I, that came I, out of my I'm mind. Not the, I'm not a musician. I, 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 I enjoy it. It can be used in other areas. Well, there's, yeah. a, there's a similarity in the, in the sense that you get a feel from music, and you actually get a feel uh, from something uh, that was constructed according to the six elements. There, it's really something like beauty. And we have questions that compare poetry to the, the yeah. composition of poetry. And even when you talk about uh, how to tell a joke, which is just telling a story. Um, uh, that, that, to me, the punchline of a joke is like the argument in a six element proposition. If, if the up. timing isn't right, if it's not set up right, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go back to some of the programmatic uh, music that's been done in the, this century, 19th, 18th centuries. I'm gonna see if I can find Euclid, your propositions, in programmatic music. It'll be fun well, to take a look. Well, this has been enjoyable. This has been terrific. Yes. And I, I really, I, there's not a book that we've had here. We've done this now for 18 years, these broadcasts. And I don't think there's a book that is more instructive and useful to the populace than this book. We need it so badly. So thank you for doing that and coming up with this. And any of you who would like to have this now, if you're watching on YouTube uh, after this program, you can still come back to us and purchase a book or seven. We'll have others uh, signed for you while they last, so we, we ask you to do come on back. Now we're... <laughs>